we say is say the hard thing first. So today that's going to be exactly what I do. And in doing so, I'm kind of starting in the middle of my story. Um, but I had an abortion when I was 19. Um, and I know that many people would think, how does anybody make that decision? And I, I get that. I get that that's hard to understand. Um, I've asked myself many times, um, actually, I've asked my 19-year-old self many times, how did you make that decision? Um, as I unpacked many things and um, went through the healing process, um, that was all revealed to me. I grew up in a non-Christian um, home in California. Please don't hold the California part against me. <laughs> um, and I had an alcoholic father, and we, we went to church on Christmas and Easter, which I'll expand more on that later. But um, needless to say, I didn't know, I really didn't know Jesus, um, didn't know truly what the Christmas and Easter story really meant. So... In saying that, in the brokenness of my home, um, I didn't have any of the tools of hope to, to use to um, deal with things. But with my father being an alcoholic, um, for those of you who have ever been to California or um, have ever seen pictures of California, the homes are very close together. Um, and so I lived in Southern California. I lived in Orange County, and the weather's great there. So often our windows were open. Um, with, um, with the dysfunction in my family, there was often uh, violence, probably once a month. And so with, with violence, a lot of times it is, there's screaming and yelling and it's loud. Um, so I knew, I knew that there was something in me that knew that the neighbors had to hear. If the windows are open and the homes are that close together, um, there was something in me that knew that the neighbors could hear. Here's the interesting thing. Um, the neighbors didn't, they didn't talk to us. They didn't look at us. They didn't, they, I mean, they didn't wave to us, nothing. And for the longest time, I actually thought, well, they were not very nice. Um, you know, as a child, that's how, that's how you process that. As I got older, I realized they were probably terrified of us. Um... And so as I, as, I, as I started thinking, you know, I don't know that I truly made that connection, but some part in me was ashamed, was ashamed of what was happening in my broken home, but never talked to any answer uncles, neighbors, friends, or anything. There were six of us kids. We did not even talk to each other about what was going on in our home. So there is where these things first started, what I call my friends of shame. I was ashamed of my broken family, and I was going to keep it all a secret of what was going on. So it really was no surprise when I became pregnant at age 19 um, and not a committed relationship. I um, went to my favorite friends and tools, I was ashamed, and I was going to keep it a secret. So after that, I did have an abortion, and I, again, was ashamed, and I sure wasn't going to tell anybody, and I didn't for 29 years. In fact, I didn't even say the word abortion for 29 years. I did everything I could to avoid that topic when it came up. I hated election years because when doesn't the topic of abortion come up during election years? <clears throat> if I even thought the direct, if the conversation was gonna head in that direction, I would either immediately change the topic some very crafty way, or I would find a way to get out of wherever that conversation was taking place. But those were the tools I had, and those were the tools that I would then go on to um, use in my life for shame and secrecy. Um, I know a lot of people 
um, might think, well, you're using that as an excuse. I want you to please hear my words. I am not condoning abortion. Abortion is always wrong. But I am telling you, it did help me understand how I got to that place. In addition to the next part of my story that helped me get to that place. And that was when I was a teenager. At age 15, I did, like I said, my, my family was very dysfunctional and broken. And my parents had just horrible upbringings, which actually, you know, led to many of their challenges. So they did the best that they could. But at age 15, I had a best friend who her mother was the stable person in my life. Um, and so... Uh, my friend and I went on a Friday night to the high school basketball game, and um, we came back home um, to her house, and we, when we came home, we arrived just on time to see them, the, um, an ambulance loading her dead body onto an ambulance because she had died of a massive heart attack instantly. One year after that, um, my 19-year-old brother committed suicide, and his um, funeral was on my 16th birthday. That really threw an already broken and damaged family into just a whole other level of brokenness. The following year after that, when I was 17, my father, that I said was an alcoholic, died in a car accident drunk driving. So, needless to say, that was not um, a great period in my life. And not only was, was I not raised in a Christian home, but we actually didn't know any Christians. There was nobody that I knew that truly knew Jesus. Looking back on what, what I know that Jesus is, is he's, 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 our, he's our everything. He is our relationship that cannot be replaced by any relationship. But nobody, I don't know anybody that knew the Lord. I knew a few people. I didn't even know that many people that went to church. I knew a few people that went to church, but this was not what their, what their walk looked like. Um, so I didn't, nobody during those, that tragic time in my life, there was nobody speaking Jesus into me, nobody telling me anything of hope, nobody pouring anything into me. In fact, um, when my brother died, when my brother committed suicide, we, um, we, my sister and I was during the school day, and my sister and I, who was two years older than I am, um, we were called into the office, and the chaplain had told us that, um, that our brother had committed suicide and that we needed to go home. And so um, here's the interesting thing after that is that I'm certain, because my husband actually is in education, I'm certain that all my teachers were notified of what had happened. Um, but when I returned to school, nobody spoke to me. Nobody checked on me. Not even the chaplain that told me that my brother committed suicide. Nobody checked on me. None of my teachers, aunts, uncles, nobody checked on us kids. Are you okay? Nothing. And I, as a teenage girl, now became very, I mean, not even, not even other students. Because now I became the fragile girl whose brother committed suicide. So I became invisible. So with all of that, I just became numb. I became numb, and I just really was a walking zombie. And I really didn't want to feel anything after that. Um, so I then turned to alcohol. I started drinking quite a bit, and, um, and I also started having um, unhealthy relationships because I just I didn't, I didn't want to feel. I didn't, I didn't want to feel anything at all. Well, needless to say, that ended up resulting in a teenage pregnancy at 19. Um, and at that point, um, 
it was with a guy that was in a, um, we, like I said, we weren't in a committed relationship. And I pretty much, because I didn't know my value, um, I pretty much just told him, hey, I'm having an abortion um, and this is when I'm going. And he didn't, he didn't say anything. I think he said something like, you want me to help pay for it? I think that was about it. Um, later, as I processed this, what I really wanted him to say is, you don't have to do this. We can do something else. And that doesn't necessarily mean I wanted him to say, we'll get married. But I, I, if he would have said something to the effect of, you know, we can co-parent or we can, we can work this out, um, it would have helped. What's really important for people to know is that the male in the situation of an unplanned pregnancy is the most um, impactful person in that decision. They are the most influential. It's not, it's not the mom or, you know, the parents or it's not a best friend. It is actually the guy in the relationship that is the most influential. Um, so... It's interesting because um, I actually didn't, like I said, I was ashamed. I, at the time, was working in a law office, and um, I told one of our clients that I hardly knew, and she said, she said, oh, she goes, you can just get an abortion. And so I said, okay. And so I did, and she actually took me to get an abortion, and um, I never saw her after that. Um, to this day, I never talked to her again. Um, and it was a um, very interesting day in that going to this abortion clinic, I sat in the waiting room um, amongst many other young ladies my age, and none of us looked at each other. And to this day, I truly believe because we were all too ashamed to look at each other. Um, so then I remember, you know, I hear about counseling, you know, that they counsel you before, they say something to you before. I honestly don't remember that. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. I would say this. It doesn't mean it does, didn't happen because I don't remember everything that happened that day, to be honest with you. The Lord has given me bits and pieces, but, um, I honestly, do, I remember them saying, fill out, these, fill out this paperwork. I remember them being very harsh and rude. I remember them yelling at me during the procedure, um, and that was kind of crazy. Um, and I remember going home that day feeling very empty and looking out my window for like two hours, just not being able to process what I had just done, but knowing that the only way, you know, I don't, or like I said, I was walking numb from the previous things that had happened in my life. And little, little did I know that I was actually adding to the death toll that had already occurred. But what I did at that day was I put this in the very corner addict of my mind. Because if I touched it, I'd think about it. And if I thought about it, I'd have to feel about it. And if I felt about it, I would feel the pain. And I'd have to deal with that pain. I didn't have the tools to deal with that pain. So I didn't. And that's when I went on for 29 years to not ever talk about it. Um, but what I want you to know is... Um, the strategies of the enemy that happen when you have an abortion. Because um, the one thing, uh, there's, so, there's several things that the enemy wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that you have crossed a line in which there is no return. I believed that lie for a long time. And I actually, at different periods in time, wanted to go to church. I... I, the Lord blessed me in letting me go on to have three uh, boys, my sons that I love dearly, um, but I actually wanted to take them to church. I didn't think I could go to church. I didn't think that God wanted me there, and I sure didn't think that his people wanted me there. 
The other strategy of the enemy is he wants you to believe that you are one of very few people that has done this horrific thing. I want you to know that one in three women of childbearing years has had an abortion. And that is not just out there in the secular world. That is here sitting in our church pews. Six out of ten women claim to be Christians. And actually attend church at least once a month. Further, that one out of three abortions, one out of three women having abortions, that actually equates to one million, one million abortions every year in the United States. If that number doesn't stagger you, it absolutely should. That's 50 million abortions, over 50 million abortions worldwide. That could be, that could be a whole continent. <laughs> That's a lot of people that are not coming into this world and a lot of people suffering about those people not coming into this world. Because the, the lie that's sold is that you won't feel anything. Like it's not going to, like it's, it's not going to impact you. There's not going to be, you won't feel anything about it. it it'll resolve your, pro, your problems. But that choice that choice you don't realize then gives you a choice to grieve that same month every time you think about the month you had your abortion. Because a lot of women really struggle in that month. They also struggle in the month that they would have actually given birth, when the birthday would have been. They struggle with the idea of, Oh, my goodness, my child would have been five. I would have sent him off to the first day of school. Or I would have celebrated a high school graduation or a college graduation. Or we'd be planning a wedding somewhere around now. Or I wonder what they would have looked like. I wonder what we would have had in common. That right to choice gives you a right to think and mourn a whole bunch of things that people don't tell you that's going to happen. And here's the further problem. We don't mourn because people, because our society makes us believe that we don't have the right to mourn because it was our choice. And at some point, we actually have to acknowledge the humanity that that was a child. Not a choice, not an event, but a real person. The other lie or scheme of the enemy is that um, when I say one in three women, that means there's a whole lot of men that have a child in heaven also. And what happens with that is the man either pushed for it, because that happens plenty of times. If you don't have an abortion, we're breaking up, because I'm not doing this. I'm out of here. Or they say, it's your body, your choice, you do what you want. And then later they realize, oh my goodness, I did not protect my unborn child. Or they didn't have a voice in it at all. And they didn't want the abortion, and they said, don't do this. And some didn't find out about it until after the abortion. And then they realized, I could not protect my unborn child. Either way, there's a whole lot of healing that needs to occur because of that. Men are affected 
by abortion just as much as women are, whether you believe it or not. We've ministered to plenty of men that have. And I just want you to know, and I'll be telling you more about it when I say we, deeper still up at Cumberland, what we do is we have free and confidential weekend healing retreats. And we have both men and women come to these retreats. We have a team of men. Men minister only to men and women minister only to women. But we want men to know if you are to be the leaders of our families, which is what God calls you to do, you cannot lead from a broken place. And many men don't even realize that this is causing them to be broken. Whether it's men or women, what happens? Well, how we start doing parenting is we either feel like, oh my goodness, I cannot fully love you know, the, li- the living children because they... Because I didn't, I didn't love this one. Or they overcompensate. I did this, so I have to give my child everything. Either way, it's parenting from an unhealthy place. That's why men and women need to heal. And men, as the leaders of their, as, as the families need to say, oh my goodness, do I need to, I might have to look at this. I might have to just think, maybe this is affecting me. And if you think it stops affecting you as you get older, you're wrong. So even once your kids go and grow up, and I'd love to ask how many, how many people have um, challenging relationships with their adult children that are post-abortive. I know I did. Before I healed, my kids were adults. And the Lord has done a beautiful work. But without healing, those relationships are going to be challenged. But I encourage you men and women. Women, if we are, if we are behaving as though men don't have an important role in the family... We are all being a part of degradating our society and our culture and our communities. So it's really important for people to heal from abortion so that they can have a positive impact on what happens here with this, with this um, abortion tidal wave, really, that's happening. Another, another thing that the enemy likes to um, deceive us with is that um, I think this is just, just us and our, our nature because we just don't want to, um, we don't want to deal. We don't want to unpack the hard stuff. But sometimes people will say to us, if you know you're forgiven, then just forget about it. And they are well-meaning people. And some of them even pastors. And that's why I'm so glad that Pastor John is, is open to talk about this and, and have us, you know, and let us bring this to your church. Yes, the forgiveness of Jesus is huge. And it is a major part of healing. But healing and forgiveness are two different things. You actually have to unpack the hard stuff and process through and heal from it all. Because, like I said, abortion doesn't just happen. Abortion does, you don't, you don't go, oh, today, life was great, life was perfect. I think I'll choose anything but life for my unborn child. Oh, and then the rest of life all goes on to be great. That doesn't happen. So you really do have to unpack everything that surrounds it and heal. The best analogy I can give you is with a, with a drug addict or alcoholic. We encourage them, go, go through recovery. There are 12 steps in recovering from addiction and alcoholism. And there is, there is redemption. People, if they truly go through with a pure heart to heal and get better, they do. Well, if there's 12 steps to recover from that, 
There's going to be at least that to recover from picking anything but life for your unborn child. You're not going to just get better. Um, so what I'd like to tell you is what can the church do better? Because I know, I know there's a, a lot of people that don't, I mean, some of you, you, you want to see, who wants to see an end to abortion? Amen. Yeah. We can all do something about it. We actually really all can do something about it. If there are one in three women that have had an abortion and a large number of men that was a part of that decision, we can be the safe place. We can be the voice that's not condemnation. Because for so long, the church has not been the place that people have felt safe to go and tell somebody that they have done this. In fact, I had a lady in another state who contacted me, and, um, and she wanted to come, and I'm, I'm prayerful that she still does. But the clergy in her church told her, yes, you do need, you need something like that. You need a retreat like that, but don't do it anywhere local because nobody in this church needs to know. Now, let me ask you this. Does that sound like the Jesus anybody else here knows? No. It's not the Jesus I know. It's not the Jesus that showed me love and grace and mercy for whatever it is I've done. I've done a whole lot of other stupid besides the abortion. And we've got to think about what were Jesus' last words? You know, close, you know, some of his last words. Father, forgive them for I, they know not what they do. That's what the church should be saying. We don't understand why you did it, and I don't have to. How many of Peter's friends didn't understand why he did what he did? Well, a whole lot of them did the same thing. You know, a lot of time the church wants to rank sin. Jesus doesn't. So I want the church to be the safe place. And I'll tell you what, I have a really good feeling about that by just listening to the amazing worship, first of all, the openness of Pastor John. The women talking to the, to the young man and praying over him, because here's the thing, what they were talking about, he had a spirit of offense, but what was the root? That a lot of times is the big thing with abortion, the root. I had no idea that I had any value. In the broken home I grew up in, I had no clue I had value. So how in the world was I going to know that the child inside me had any value? So this is, besides being the safe place, this is what else you can do to turn the tide on abortion because many of you raised your hands. So I'm guessing you want to be a part of turning the tide on abortion. Amen? Amen. We had a bunch of little kids that ran out of here. Pour into your youth. Pour into your youth. Pour into your teenagers. And even if you're not one of the ones that wants to be in with the littles, there's plenty of administrative stuff to do. Whether that's helping the teacher. There's a lot to do in a church, y'all. I, I serve in mine, so I know. I serve in children's church, in fact. 
You can help get the classroom ready. You can ask, you know, can I get the craft? Can I pick up the snacks? There's a ton of things that you can do to help to free up the teachers that are going to spend time with them so that they can um, make sure that the lesson is about letting these children know their identity in Christ. Because that is the most important thing that these kids can leave this church with as they go on, and maybe they'll be here forever, but as they walk their journey into adulthood, is for them to know their value and for them to know their identity in Christ. Because that, my friends, is going to be what turns the tide on abortion. It is not going to be voting at the polls. It is going to be God's people. So those, to me, are the two biggest things. Be the safe place. How do you do that? I am challenging everyone. We've got brochures out in the lobby. Stop by and get one of our brochures. I want you to open up the hard conversations with your friends. Hey, this crazy lady came to our church and talked about abortion. In fact, she even told everybody about it. And the reason I want you to do that is because maybe, just maybe, and what I want you to say is, I just want you to know that if you have ever had one in your past, please know that I will love you through whatever. And I will not judge you. I will not condemn you. But I do not want you to silently suffer. So here is information. There is help here. People here can help you heal. I want you to know my friend Lori, um, who's on my team, is just beautiful. Her and my other friend April... They both had gone through their retreats. Um, Lori had gone through hers first. And um, these two actually lived a life together for 15 years. Doing ministry, going to life group, raising boys together, everything. Never told each other about their abortions. And they both specifically remember having a conversation one time at Life Group saying, you just don't know what I've done. And the other one saying, well, we've all done stuff. You just don't know what I've done. And neither one of them ever thinking for a second that the other one was talking about an abortion. So as I was forming my team, because we don't only have post-abortive people on my team, we have some non-post-abortive. So when I had my first meeting, and they came in, they, you know, they walked in and saw each other, and they figured, oh, they're just here to help. Little did they know I was going to hit them with, you know what, we're going to do this. We all have to learn to be vulnerable with each other. And I had, I had our whole team tell their stories. And there the friends that had been friends for 15 years found out the other one had had an abortion. That's how much the enemy wants to silence us and keep a grip on us and make us feel like we can never heal from this. That's not how our Jesus works. He does not want us to take this to our grave. We were never intended to carry something as heavy as choosing who gets to live and who gets to die. But the greater truth is, as much as we mess up and he doesn't love what we do, he paid a high price to cover even that regrettable sin. You know, I was thinking about this the other day as I prayed about coming to speak here. Um, in, in, you know, my drunken phase, I remember, I remember being on the back of a motorcycle. If anybody knows California, I lived in Orange County and I was with friends. We were at an event and, um, we were down in San Diego. So it's about two and a half hour drive. Um, and just got lit, got lit up and, um, drove on the back of a friend's motorcycle that day. 
and really for all into I mean I was for all intents and purposes I should have fallen asleep and fallen off of the back of that motorcycle honestly and now because of what the Lord has me doing I can't help but think that he was just sitting there with his hand on my back going girl when you're done with your stupid I got some stuff for you to do <laughs> You know, he covers us, even through horrendous. But you can't do those things if you don't heal. If you had a gaping wound in your arm, would you just leave it? Would you get rushed to the doctor and get it healed? You would seek healing. Okay, so let's see where I am here. Oh, my story. Let me give you my story real quick. So I actually didn't come to know Jesus until I was 46 years old. I moved here, as I said, I, was, I lived in California. Um, I came out here with the Nissan move. Corporate headquarters were in L.A. It was great. I mean, I used to actually travel to Smyrna to go to a meeting, so I loved Tennessee. I thought it was beautiful. So when, when they relocated, I moved out here. Needless to say, I relocated a teenage, um, a teenage son who, um, that was a challenge, but I was just trying to make sure he got connected. Fortunately, he played football, um, and nine months into it, once I know, knew he had made friends and he was settled and everything was going okay, it hit me that I did not have any friends out here. And so I went, I need to do something to get connected. And so I um, actually contacted um, some people on the football team and said, hey, how can I help out? And they pointed me to a woman named Lana who was oversaw the booster club. And um, so I sent her an email, and, um, and so she sent one back and said, well, yeah, I'd love to meet with you, meet, meet me for coffee. Being a coffee lover, that was a given, so of course I met um, and so we met, and following that, she, um, well, after, after we were done meeting, I just said, whatever this girlfriend has, I want. She never mentioned Jesus' name one time. But everything about her oozed Jesus. And from there, her friends, um, her and her friends actually started a life group. I didn't know at the time it was for my purpose. <laughs> um, and we rotated homes every week and had, um, and, sh and had dinner and started studying God's word. And I was just trying to make friends. So, of course, they said, you know, we're going to do this. You want to join us? And, you know, we're going to study the Bible. And I was like, sure, I'll do that. So I did that. Well, I realized at one point in time when we were, we were studying Luke that they were trying to find out if I was saved or not. Um, and... I, I have to laugh now about the questions they were asking me because some of them, like one was, you know, did you know that Jesus was born of a virgin? Yeah, sure, I know. Do you believe that? Yeah, sure, I believe that. Did you know he died on a cross for our sins? Yeah, sure, I believe that. I mean, I answered everything right without having any clue the depth of all of it. None of it. They loved me through it. Fast forward, I ended up getting saved um, in my home in a time because, that, you know, as I'm studying God's word, um, boy, he was stirring up a lot in me. The Holy Spirit is just, he's just always there. Um, and I was going to, I was going to sin yet again. Um, and so I just, I asked, I was home alone and I asked God, I just said, don't let me mess up again. Just don't let me mess up again. And he didn't. And he diverted me away from the sin that I so desperately wanted. Um, but that's how I know it's the Holy Spirit. He had to pray that for me. I would have never prayed that on my own. I would have prayed, let me get my way with this. I would have, honestly. So it was him. And he did that day. And, and then I went on to say, if you hold on to me, I'll hold on to you. And he has been faithful to do that ever since. 
So no, there is power in pouring into people. When it's time for Jesus to, to grab, or for us to grab hold of him, I should say, they will. So no, it's important to pour into people, and opening up this difficult conversation of abortion might be an opportunity. So, my healing. Fast forward. After that, um, oh, I went to a women's conference, um, and um, the speaker said, if there's anything you need to lay down at the cross, this was two years into my journey after I was saved, um, is there anything that you need to lay down at the cross once and for all, just give it to Jesus? And I told you I, I didn't think of my abortion because I didn't want to feel the pain. Again, the Holy Spirit relentless. The first thing that came to my mind was my abortion. So I wrote it. I wrote it. They give you a piece of paper. I wrote it on this piece of paper and super tiny because I didn't want anybody to see it. And I folded it up, and I walked trembling to the cross, and I hung it on the cross. And I kept looking back because I thought for sure it was going to fall down and open up, and everybody was going to see my deep, dark secret. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, but after that, I then walked to the altar and wept for my child, my unborn child, for the very first time. And again, the presence of the Lord was with me, just like he was in my home when I got saved. I knew he was there. I knew he was present. I felt his love. I felt his grace. And I felt his mercy. Fast forward after that, I had to come. I, well, actually, not fast forward. Not long after that. In fact, the drive home. Um, something crazy, first of all, I went with seven other women, and this was up in Ohio, so we drove back home for like seven hours, um, and I actually um, never told those seven women what I was weeping about at the altar. That's how much the enemy wants want you to be afraid, because I thought, these women, they're not even going to let me drive back with them if I tell them. So at that point in time, I didn't tell them. So, but I did come home. I was, not, um, I was not married at the time, but I was dating a man that I wanted to marry. And, um, and I knew I had to tell him. He had known Jesus since he was 10 years old. And, um, yeah, our background's about as different as day and night. That's another whole comic story. But um, um, so I did. I, said, I called him, and I said, hey, we need to talk. And so we met, and I told him, you know, I thought this man's done with me. He's never going to see me again. Um, that's not how it goes. Um, he said, that is not who you are anymore. And so we're about ready to celebrate our 10th anniversary in December. So that was a beautiful moment. Um, so, but with that, so not long after that, I can't tell this story of grace of the Lord without crying. Um, so after that, um, we did some cardboard testimonies at our church. We were talking about it. I'd become friends with the pastor's wife. And we wanted to make sure that everybody was getting across the idea that statistics are not just numbers. They're real people. And so we wanted them to know, you know, divorce isn't just a number. Suicide's not just a number. Drug addiction's not just a number. And then she said abortion. And um, I was like, oh, and I just kind of skirted around that issue. Well, then we started naming off so-and-so could hold the one up about addiction. I know they do it, and so we started naming off people. We had got to all of them, and we got to the one about abortion, and I just went silent. And I'm like, again, the Holy Spirit would be relentless. Um, she said, I know there's women in our church that have had abortion, but there's no way they'd ever hold this sign. I just went silent, took a breath, and said, you don't have to ask anybody else to hold that sign. I will hold that sign. And so I did. And that um, two Sundays later, there I was with tears streaming down my face, holding my sign that said abortion, and then on the back said forgiven. Um, 
and you know, and there I was, and I, I planned to take that secret to my grave, but there I was in front of our whole congregation um, revealing what I had done, and people were just gracious, honestly. Um, but from there, I wanted to serve at a, um, at a pro-life pregnancy clinic, and in order to do that, you had had to receive some healing to deal with your abortion, if you had an abortion in your past. And so um, I had done a Bible study, and it got me thinking about some things that I had not thought about in a long time. But then I also wanted to make sure that I was not, um, that I wasn't, um, putting any of my own junk on any of the clients I might be ministering to. So I wanted to make sure I had received as much healing as possible. So I asked the office manager, and she was actually the one that pointed me to Deeper Still. The home office is in Knoxville, so I went to Deeper Still, my healing retreat there. And again, the presence of the Lord was so obvious. And he walked alongside me and worked through every bit of healing that I needed. And what happens at a deeper still retreat? Yes, the focus is to heal from the abortion because it is touching far more things than we ever realize. But it helps heal from so many other things. And it helped me heal from the tools of shame and secrecy and all those other crazy things. And it helped me to know that my identity in Christ was real. Like, these weren't stories. It changed my life. That retreat was absolutely life-changing. And the Lord laid on my heart, I want you to bring deeper still back to the Upper Cumberland. And so from there, that's what's happened. And he had us grow the team. And that's what we're doing. We are having free and confidential. We make them free because we don't want there to be any reason why somebody can't find healing. And we make them confidential for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, some people, you know, are terrified. They don't want people to know. My hope is that y'all help your people know if you are not yourself post-abortive, we want you to be the safe place. Um, but you can see the pictures if you come up later. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice homey place. It's a beautiful environment. We, um, we feed everybody well and meet everybody's dietary needs because we know that people have a lot of restrictions these days. Um, but... Um, with that, our spring retreat is, um, I mean, we have three retreats a year, spring, summer, and fall. We just had our fall retreat. So our next retreat is actually April 8th through the 10th. We, um, again, I want everybody to get a brochure as they walk out. We're going to be just at the table outside where the information is, where the inf your normal information table is. Because if you yourself don't need it, Somebody you know does. If one of three people, you know somebody, you know, there's no way, it's not possible for you to not know somebody that has been a part of this abortion decision. Um, so please, we want you to take a brochure. And um, we also have other resources in the back. If you do, um, if you call that number or somebody that you direct to us, um, call the number on the back. I am the only one that answers that phone. I'm the only one that sends texts to that phone. So please make sure that you get people directed um, to receiving healing. Jesus will change their life. Amen. Thank you so much.